I would like to acknowledge the OCLC Research Library Partnership, which both underwrites and inspires our work. Attendees of this webinar are from the OCLC RLP, and I want to thank you for your continued support and input into our work. These are both crucial to our success. Uh, today, I am really excited to welcome our, um, our presenters. Uh, frequently in the Works in Progress webinar series, we have uh, folks from partner institutions presenting on their work, but today I'm so, so pleased to uh, present two great colleagues from our European office, um, Sheng Wei Wang and Rob Koopman, who are going to present on their project um, Ariadne, which I think is very exciting. And um, I'm really thrilled that they're going to be able to share with us today. So Sheng Wei is going to start off by giving us an overview of the project, and then Rob is going to give a daring uh, live demonstration, um, which hopefully will work out. It, it looked great earlier today. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to um, Sheng Wei so that she can do the presenting and unmute you. Okay, Sheng Wei, you are all uh, you are all set. Please take it Thank away. you. Thank you, Mary, for the introduction. And I'm sure good good morning. Oh, well, good morning. <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is Sheng Wei Wang. I'm a research scientist in the OCLC and also assistant professor at the University of Twente. As Mary said, together with Rob, uh, we will present our work on scalable cement embedding today. Um, Okay. Oh. Yes. Um, to, uh, first, I would like to give you a list of things that we believe that cement embedding can help with. For example, information retrieval, entity disambiguation, deduplication, recommendation, subject prediction, clustering. All those things um, are very common in libraries and many other cultural heritage institutes. Um, you might not believe me, but get, let me give you an example. So here I search for Aoman Pianjian, which is a Chinese title for Pride and Prejudice. I checked the author box. Um, actually, to be more precise, I look for the most uh, related person in the data set. Um, here at the bottom, you can see Austin Jane. Of course, she's the author. And then the Chinese, trans, uh, Chinese character in the middle, you see Austin is a Chinese transliteration in Chinese character for Austin. And you also see our upper right, an Austin, Austin, uh, with an or without spaces. They are a romanization of the Chinese trans, uh, characters, which is transliteration of Austin. And top, uh, top right, uh, left will be the uh, Wang Ke Yi. Uh, he's one of the uh, translators who translated this work into Chinese. So semantic, these are um, also strings, and uh, I search for a um, kind of Chinese uh, string for pride and prejudice. Semantic embedding helps us to find um, relations between these kind of arbitrary strings in the data set. Um, the reason we can do this is because we have the big records. Um, the fact that these strings co-occur in the same big record already tells us there was something between these strings. There might be a relationship between them, but we don't really know. Of course, one big, rep big record is not enough, but that's not a problem for us because we have hundreds of millions of records. We can leverage all these statistics, statistics and collect it from this large corpus, and then that will be a powerful tool to help us to find the relationship between things we want to know. That basically is really the foundation for semantic embedding um, from natural language processing point of view or statistical um, semantics point of view. Uh, words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings, or a word is characterized by the company it keeps. This might sound a bit abstract to you. Um, just another example. Just spend a few seconds to read these sentences. 
And as a common um, people, then you probably already guess what this body work is. It is kind of uh, alcohol, uh, alcoholic beverage made of grapes. So basically, you look at the, the words around um, a concept or a word, then you can um, really um, get to know what this, mean, this word really means. Probably not 100%. But to 80, 90 percent, you can already guess um, correctly. So going back, um, talking to the talking about semantic embedding, the idea is very simple. Um, basically, it's just using vectors of numbers to represent the meaning of a word or sentences or a document. So here is an example. You use four numbers to represent a dog or cat or lion. Of course, not every word or not every type kind of vector uh, works. The point of semantic embedding is trying to put semantically similar words together. Then um, in this semantic space, uh, each vector, um, well, you can say they are points in a space. Semantically similar words, they are similar points uh, sorry, the points nearby to each other. Then the desirable property of semantic embedding is really the computable similarity. Since every, everything is represented numerically, for machine or automated process, it's very easy to find the similarity, the compute similarity. Um, semantic embedding uh, is not really a new research. It's long lasting uh, since early 50s. Um, people use, traditionally use the um, global co occurrence count based methods. Basically, they count the co occurrences between words and then they end up with a gigantic co occurrence matrix. So, you can actually directly work in with such long, gigantic matrix, but that is really uh, computationally expensive and matrix is fast, so it's not really optimal. So people use dimensional reduction methods to produce this gigantic co-occurrence matrix into a smaller one, and then, um, then you can work with the smaller dimensional uh, vectors to represent the word. Since 2013, the word to vec um, people are more excited about the local context predictive models. And a lot of people have proposed to use uh, more complex <clears throat> or powerful deep learning models to embedding words, sentences, or documents. And we are also interested or excited to try those deep learning methods in our corpus, of course. But quickly we find out there are weaknesses of applying those deep learning models. So first, um, for a deep learning model, they often give you pre-trained word embeddings. They can actually, there are a lot of people using those pre-trained word embeddings for the under uh, downstream applications like sentiment or classification problems. But the problem is these pre-trained word embeddings might not capture the domain-specific semantics. For example, if you work on uh, medical information retrieval, or working on some really special uh, collections. Those embeddings trained on Google News or Twitter corpus really doesn't re uh, capture the semantics you are really care about. Then if you want to train them from scratch, uh, it comes the computational way, it is very expensive. It often requires GPUs, not everybody has. Uh, until recently, we only had got one GPU to run more deep learning models on our data, our, our, on our own work. And another problem with deep learning is the uh, complex uh, optimization problem. It is difficult to find the optimal hyperparameter setting. It comes with the default setting for a lot of parameters. You can use them. And once you want to change um, some of them, you don't really know change to this one or change to two or change to three have any consequences, good or bad um, influence. It's not too easy to explain. And standard benchmark or evaluation methods 
um, often do not answer practical needs that we will come back to uh, later in the presentation. So in the meantime, we were trying to answer this question, can we find a method that is fast and discriminative? That is what we were focusing on the last few years. Um, that really comes through our Ariadne semantic embedding. Um, we basically, there were three important points in our work. First one, it is a very fast, efficient, random projection um, process to compute term embeddings. Here, terms, we mean almost um, words, phrases, or entities. The second point, you use orthogonal projection to increase discrimination. And third point is to um, assign suitable weights for each different terms in order to compute the uh, document or text embedding. And we'll go into each point uh, briefly. Um, so the random projection itself, it is um, basically the global co-occurrence based method. You have a C matrix here. Um, the, this is a co-occurrence matrix. Each element of this matrix is the count of um, contacts, or in our case, is bib records. How many bib records contain the two entities, uh, both, no, both the entities? So the entities, we mean uh, words, uh, phrases, or subjects, uh, authors, or citations. So you end up with a gigantic matrix. Then you multiply this matrix with a random, project, a random matrix consists of minus one and plus one. Um, then it ends up with a very slim uh, C prime, the right matrix. Each row is still representing one term or one entity on the left, but their dimension is much smaller. Here, D, we normally use from yeah, 100 to 500 or 1,000 at most, then end up, uh, it is um, much slimmer to compute anything like cosine similarity between them. Thanks to the linear operation of the matrix multiplication, these, um, uh, this multiplication can be computed very fast, efficient, and to be honest, we don't really, we never really store the gigantic C. We just I, I um, alternate, uh, on dynamically uh, online the uh, sub, uh, updating the C prime. So this is uh, very fast. The good news is um, um, the C prime can be computed very fast. Um, I will show you later how fast it is compared to other methods. But the bad news here is the resulting term embedding, like d-dimensional uh, vector for each term, subject, they are not really usable because um, we don't really filter out subwords, uh, whether, whether it's task-based or specific data set specific or even language specific, like uh, uh, the, that, this in English, for example. So these, ter these subwords co-occur a lot with almost everything. So most terms end up being similar to the average vector, uh, which corresponds closely to the stop words. So then they are mostly similar to each other. Um, so we did find a very efficient, effective tricks to, to solve this problem. First to cancel out the average vector from the embedding, and then use the original similarity to this average vector to inform the importance of the terms. Um, graphically speaking, it's probably, um, I hope this will be easier to understand. So you have the VA, the middle part, the average factor of the language, and then V1 and V2 are two words. Um, because they co-occur with a lot with the stop word, uh, the average factor, the end, the raw result of the uh, random projection, the two vectors are similar in terms of alpha one is smaller, so we don't really see the difference between the two words. 
But if you project to this hyperplane, which is orthogonal to this VA, um, then the difference between these two vectors become much bigger. And then you can use this to find the real difference between the words. Instead of because they, similar, they are both English, then they are by default similar to each other compared to French or German or Chinese. And so this is an effective way to remove the stop wordiness of the resulting um, term embedding that really increase the indiscriminating power of the term embedding. In the meantime, since we can compute the original uh, similarity to the average vector, uh, we can use this similarity to determine how much weight each term should have if you use them to compute the document embedding. Because if the vector is very similar to an average vector, which is more or less a stop word, then you should consider them much if you want to know what the document means. So this is also a crucial way to assign, to find the most important words in your document in order to represent the meaning of the document. Um, so that's basically the most technical part of the, our presentation. Um, we compared our methods, uh, our method with, of course, the state of the art, a few other document embedding methods, uh, including DocToVec, FastTag, or SendToVec. Um, we applied the same method to two different data sets. One of them is the English, uh, simple English Wikipedia. Another one is a subset of Medline. We use our own server to test all different methods. The minimum document frequency is 10, which means we ignored all the uh, entities or terms which occurred less than 10 bib records. The dimensionality of the embeddings is 256. As I said, you can just choose it from 100 to 1,000, which is, again, an arbitrary number, but we like, we like the, the number is which the power of two. So that uh, um, we use some kind of benchmark to evaluate different methods. So this is one of the benchmarks to evaluate the embedding for a um, text. This STS benchmark um, consists of, I think it's about 8,000 pairs of sentences. Each pair of sentences um, is judged by a human. Um, the number on the left shows how people judge the two sentences are uh, similar to each other, ranging from one to five. One means they are very different. Five means they are almost they, they are exactly the same. So the bench, using this benchmark, the different software or tools um, compute the document embedding or sentences embedding, and using the cosine similarity to find the similarity between those sentences. Um, then we use the Pearson correlation try to see how correlated between the human judgment and the software uh, uh, produce a similarity. So the, the higher correlation means the, the program really captures the semantics of the sentence and makes a good judgment. So remember, the number is the higher, the better. These are the results. In the official uh, website about this STS benchmark, um, Doc, uh, DocTovac, FastTag, SendTovac, they use their own corpus and reached quite good results, but we don't know how long they train and we don't have the access to those corpus. So we tried them to on these two uh, corpus we have. And you can see um, applied to the same corpus, we really outperform other methods. Another point, another place of this table I would like to be uh, to emphasize is the lower right, the numbers in terms of seconds and compared to the other numbers in terms of hours, two hours, three hours, compared to our 43 seconds. Something we really, um, we are really proud of. 
So it really um, is a very efficient way of computing the embedding, and the resulting embedding actually works pretty good if compared to the if applied to the same data set. Um, this table gives you the effect of our two um, crucial tricks to do the orthogonal projection and weighting. You can see with projection, the number goes up quite a bit. And with, uh, without weighting, uh, in terms of uh, calculating the sentence embedding, if you're using the um, TSI, which is a very standard weighting scheme in NLP, in natural language processing, um, our weighting really still um, outperforms the tra traditional one. These are some concrete examples for the weight. Um, for the normal stop words like for or so, they occur so much, so many times. Sorry, the DT here on the document frequency means they occur like four occurred in uh, more than 720,000 bit records in this one million data set. Um, at, look at uh, if you look at the inflammatory mRNA antibodies, they occur more or less equally frequent with achieved or subsequent, which are not traditional or um, common sense of stop words. If you say, if you uh, study with a normal English corpus, but they do have much less weight in terms of the, this medical corpus because we don't really, they really don't carry much of semantics of documents. On the other hand, the mRNA inflammatory um, antibodies, they are really important in terms of this uh, corpus, even though they occur really, really a lot often. Um, so that's basically um, our comparison with the other method. Now let's get back to this uh, list of things uh, from the very beginning. I hope you are more convinced that Actually, we can do something with embedding, semantic embedding, in terms of uh, for these uh, all these tasks I listed here. Of course, we have ourselves also applied it to many other um, tasks. One of them is the topic extraction in cytometrics. These are different groups of uh, cytometricians working on the same corpus, and other people, other research teams are using citation information. We are using embedding, semantic embedding of the documents, and we reached almost equal or competitive results. Since there are no gold standards, but we can compare with each other, we are not. We reached a good result. Um, more deeply today, we would like to more to say much a bit more on subject prediction. Um, so there are different ways to to use those semantic similarities once they are embedded in the same semantic state. You can use um, semantically a similarity naively because a document, you can just use the, the subject which has uh, highest cosine similarity to the document. That, that is, we call it naive similarity. It's a really straightforward way to use similarity. Or you can use a, a non-parametric method, which is look into your neighbors. If you have a new con document coming in, then you find the most similar documents in the training set uh, and look at them, how they are, how they are um, subject uh, indexed, then use those to index yourself. There's this new one. This is different ways of um, uh, using similarity. And uh, we tried it to predict the mesh subjects for um, uh, Medline articles. We have a training set uh, which consists of uh, one million uh, metadata, uh, sorry, metadata uh, Medline articles. And in this training set, we have about 150,000 uh, unique mesh subjects. Each of them is indexed with on average 16 uh, mesh subjects. So the task here is to select in average 16 mesh subjects from there's 150,000 candidates, which is uh, not really easy for a computer. 
And we tested on the 10,000 articles, with 10 new articles, 10,000 new articles from Medline uh, to predict our subject. Since everything is ranked by the similarity, uh, we can measure the precision of recall in terms of top 10, top 20 to top 100. So we have the results plotted here. The Ariadne R is the uh, naive based, naive uh, similarity based prediction. Uh, plus NPSP is the natural language, uh, sorry, the neighborhood based method, non parametric one. You use looking at 25 most similar documents in a data set and use them to, to get your own subject. Fastex is one of the multi class classifier and developed by Facebook and then almost doing the same job. So as you can see, the clear winner is basically this neighborhood based method really gives you good coverage and precision, even at the lower rank. But that is also uh, that is not um, the end of the story. Of course, if you look at the, uh, the this example, I will not try to read the title because a lot of the words I have difficulties pronounce. Um, just to to glance what you can understand it, I don't really know. Um, if you look at the these are the results from different methods. At left, a left column are the real ones assigned by human um, uh, from Medline, PubMed. The DT here again is the within this one million training set, how many um, big records are indexed by this uh, concept. Uh, so uh, quite a few of them used. Uh, we used very few times for, for example, 24 bib records in a 1 million used by the capsule law taxes. And if you look at the far right, the results from far text, human, female, middle-aged, male risk factors, up till now, the precision are 100%. But that is not telling you uh, what this paper is about. And that is also getting back to the point I mentioned before, the benchmark used in the literature, they are precision at one, three, or five. They really, doesn't, they really don't tell you about actually which method works the best. So of course, I would want to show you the Ariadne results. If you look at them, they are really to the point, um, especially the top 10, or they really, um, they might be a bit competitive, but they do really tell you what this paper is about. And many of those subjects are used in very few times in the, in the training set. The neighborhood-based method kind of balancing out the two types of prediction. It still finds out the common ones, which are correct, but, doesn't, but uh, don't tell you the real meaning of the document, but still keeps capable of keeping those specific ones still tells you what the paper is about. So um, again, there are different ways to evaluate the kind of prediction. I just want to say the if you look at the literature, um, the measurement there need to be more um, more it needs to be improved because precision one and three until five for us is not correct, uh, is not useful. Um, that's the exercise with Medline. We also apply to uh, another completely different um, data set, which is Astro. Which, um, it contains 111,000 articles in astronomy and astrophysics. Again, we use 95% for training and 5% for testing. Measurement will be exactly the same, precision recall to top of top end predictions. So here um, our method still outperforms the fast tag. But the point here I would like to mention, uh, to give is uh, we're not only if, um, predicting subjects, you can predict anything you embed in your semantic space. For example, you can 
predict citations or authors. And they are not, they probably don't look perfect, but they can be a good recommendation or suggestions for people to, to see who has written about the same topic or what kind of citations we can. And also, one of the evaluation methods I forgot to mention is if you look at this table, many of them are chosen by program, but they might not be really wrong, even if they are not chosen by the human at the time. So still you need to look at those results and have a more qualitative evaluation to see whether which method really gives you the good result. Um, yeah. Um, in another um, task we had in the, we participated in this ICT with industry workshop. One of the use cases there is the, from the KB, National Library of the Netherlands. We tried to explore um, NLP and machine learning methods for semi automatic cataloging. And that, that week, the particular work is to automatically assign Brinkman subjects to PhD thesis. So they provide a data set that, uh, for example, the Brinkman thesaurus contain about 15,000 keywords and 40,000 PhD thesis from six Dutch universities. And about 24,000 of them have with manual assigned Brinkman, which is perfect for the training and testing. And there were different teams or different researchers from different universities working on the same problem. And at the end of the week, we test different methods on the same task. These are the results which published by AKB recently. And the last line is us. Um, clearly, we are um, really giving the good results in terms of assigning Brinkman to the thesis. Um, we have also ongoing collaboration with the National Library of Germany. Basically, we want to use the same method to apply to predict the DND subjects, uh, DDC subject category, categories, or DDC basic numbers. We applied the method and uh, conducted our own automatic evaluation, like what I showed you before, the precision at top to up to. 100 positions, and the preliminary results are looking good. So we submitted our results to the DNB, and then they are actually conducting the manual evaluation right now. Uh, hopefully, in a short while, we can report some more concrete results in terms of our this pilot project. Uh, with this, I would like to give the floor to Rob to do some live demo because there are some functionality you can actually use uh, to develop, which I didn't report here. Okay, Rob, I've unmuted you and turned things over to you, so take it away. Thank you, Rome Safari. You see the right screen? Yes, it looks good. Okay. We made a, a demo for Medline. This Medline demo doesn't contain 1 million records, but actually contains 20 million records. So almost complete Medline. We left out all the Medline articles without abstract or foreign language Medline without English. This is the user interface. There is an input box where you can use two queries. For instance, preschool. And the system re will return with a list of articles which it thinks are related with preschool. That doesn't mean that the text preschool actually occurs in the article. It just means that the records of those articles are close to preschool. Uh, in this example, we do see preschool, but that is not really necessary. And you see that we get a whole list of preschool-related articles. 
If you put push in entities, you can see here uh, words which are related to preschool. I can also look at authors related to preschool. We can even check whether this author really writes about preschool things, and it looks like it does. And, oops, and we can do uh, subjects. And these are also things about preschool, as far as you can see. And for instance, we can look at uh, ISSN and get a list of journals about uh, preschool. Of course, it's not really a journal about preschool, but these are related uh, journals. That they all occur twice is uh, because they all have an electronic and a paper version. And we didn't filter out uh, anything. Let's do another query. I try to keep them a little bit uh, reasonable because it's a very uh, eerie database. You shouldn't look at this database too long. I looked for flu pandemic and here you see articles about flu pandemic. Uh, of course, you can also see the subject headings for relates to flu pandemic. And these are clearly subjects related to recent flu pandemics. You can also quest, you can also do something else. Let's look for historical and do a query. Now to get historical things in Medline, which is not so interesting, but we have a screen where you combine queries. So now I select the flu pandemic and his histological historical I want to have. <laughs> Go back. Historical and flu pandemic. We combine the two by telling the system you should look at uh, the two of them. And then you get uh, more uh, about uh, older flu pandemics like the pandemic or epidemic influenza 1830, 1848. But the system, just like normal queries, allows you to do some kind of Boolean queries. You can even I don't want to want to have historical and flu pandemic. Now I said should get more uh, current things like avian flu pandemic preparedness, but this is more about things that are happening now and more modern pandemics. If this was all, it might not be so interesting. But I have a Medline article here, which is about Q fever. Uh, this was very, a few years ago, we had a large epidemic of Q fever in the Netherlands. But this is an article about it. We can go to the full text. It's a public uh, domain article. Don't need to read it. I just uh, copy everything in this article. Go back to Ariadne and paste it in the query. So now I paste the whole article and use it as a query. Hopefully it uh, returns me related articles about Q fever and immuno PCR, whatever that might mean. And as you see, uh, it looks Coxiali Bonetti is the bacteria actually causing uh, Q fever. I can look at the entities and the subject headings are Q fever and Coxiella Bonetti. The third one is antibodies viral, and that is wrong. It's the bacteria. It's typically an error. Uh, this program can make because it looks at related antibodies and does make a difference between viral and bacterial. Yeah, we told you about that the method we also can look at nearest neighbors. So we can instruct the program to look at 20 nearest neighbors and then make a new list of subject settings. So I do the query again. Look at entities and now get different queries like humans, Q Reaper, uh, PCR, the preliminary chain reaction, which was PCR. 
And now it finds it's an antibodies bacterial. So it's more to the point and it also finds the more infrequent terms. We can compare that with the keywords actually assigned by the research by uh, Medline. Uh, it looks like we missed the DNA part where we have most of the others. Okay, new example. Uh, last week in CNN, there was an art article about Black Death. Uh, some people in China uh, actually getting the disease. Uh, yeah, once in a while, people get afraid of uh, the plague. So let's see what Ariadne thinks of this article. Again, I copy the whole article. Go to Ariadne and paste it in the query as a query. And I find articles related to uh, the article we just saw. So, you see that pestis is the bacteria causing the plague. And we see to our fear that it's also uh, in the USA, not only China. And, uh, the plague is not an ancient disease. It's also not special. Uh, it's just occurring regularly. Currently, still, we have a few thousand deaths in the last few years. Uh, you make uh, the interest in other things like uh, genome. We can com we can combine those two. And now we find uh, information about the genome of the uh, black death. Uh, uh, look, we have a prehistoric, goes to history, combined prehistoric with the article we just had, you go again. And now we have articles about the Stone Age plague and the persistence in Eurasia. You can de even do things as I am not interested in actually the plague, but I am interested in in similar things in context. So I say, I don't want the senior pestis. I move the slider to the left. And I am interested in the article. I move the slider to the right. So now we uh, remove the bacteria yes, senior pestis from the article as it, as it be. So I do the query again. And now it's more about zoonosis and, uh, and diseases which are in animals and go into humans and uh, this is really to the point okay with this i would like to end my short demo i hope it's clear now thank you rob and i will turn things back over to sheng wei um sheng wei you should be able to continue the presentation i'm going to unmute you okay um well, basically, that's summarized uh, the presentation today. Um, we just presented to you the method which can do the uh, embedding very efficiently. And we have developed the tricks to increase the discriminative power of the term uh, document embeddings, which make it really useful. And um, as you can see, a lot of uh, applications we have tried, and, and including the demo Rob just gave you, I hope you are more convinced now that we really can use semantic embedding um, on top of our traditional keyword-based um, methods to, in, to solve or to help. We do a lot of tasks in libraries and other cartridge institutes. Um, if you have more ideas how to use those semantic embedding into your particular task, 
um, please let us know. We would be very happy to to try at least to use the cement embedding to help you or to give you a little bit improvement in your um, application. And I put a list of things about uh, Ariadne, which we have published recent years. Um, uh, yeah, uh, if you're interested, you can get into them. Um, that really is the last one. Um, thank you very much for your attention and participation. And I, I want to thank you also very much. Um, and thanks also to our audience for sticking with a um, uh, somewhat technical presentation, but something that I think uh, helps to show uh, the promise of these uh, data science techniques. Um, uh, I want to invite people, if you have questions or observations, to please uh, enter those into chat. Um, you also have the invitation uh, to, um, uh, to share your ideas for uh, applications in your own environment with um, Rob and Sheng Wei. Uh, so uh, we'd also be, uh, on behalf of the OCLC research team, we're also really happy to hear about um, your uh, ideas for, for applications um, in your own environment. And as you can see, uh, Tizia shared a, um, a link to a recording of a, uh, um, a, a video from uh, a Liebherr webinar uh, where the National Library of the Netherlands um, uh, where uh, Ariadne scored uh, well compared to other tools. Um, and uh, Sheng Wei also talked about our uh, uh, collaboration with the German National Library. So OCLC, along with um, other you know, large national libraries, are of course interested in um, the promise of, of scaling out. I have I had a question uh, just based on um, Rob's demonstration. Um, so a lot of times we hear about you know there's kind of um, uh, uh, what do I want to say sensational news stories about um, medical things. I mean there's sensational news stories about all kinds of things, but considering that you have the the Medline um, uh, data set here. Could you use the Medline set to, uh, to see if news stories are overly sensational or if they're representing the truth? Um, is, that, is that perhaps a, um, an application for this, is kind of uh, combating or checking fake news about medical information? Uh, I don't know whether it's possible to do it automatically. I think it would be possible if we, yeah, in Medline there are lots of articles, also less uh, scientific articles, but in general I use it to debunk uh, articles in newspapers like this plague in China thing. I was really thinking this is really sensational and a bit over the top, so I looked it up in Medline and find out that the disease is current and uh, is, has been with us for already 5,000 years. And that, uh, for instance, in Madagascar, there are still a lot of cases, but now with modern antibiotics, it's much less of a problem. So I use it quite often for those things. Um, thank you. Uh, so here is a uh, question from Kimberly Weeks. I'm interested in the history tab during the demonstration. If you do not move the slider all the way to the left, would those history times be a part of future queries? If so, can you remove history items? Um, so Rob, maybe, maybe I could shift back over to you and you could share again and talk about that. Let's talk about that, that history tab a little more. Always want to go to the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Actually, this history tab, uh, I keep the last 20 queries. And uh, you can use the sliders in several positions. So if it's in the middle, it more or less means ignore this. So 
that basically ignore this for queries. It's not just removing, it's just not looking at it. As soon as you put the sliders to the left or the right, it has a meaning. Uh, I put the slider to the left, it says I want articles that are not prehistoric. If I move it to the right, it says I want articles that are prehistoric. Even try. Prehistoric, this is all prehistoric and periodic. So, and this is a way of doing and and not, or and or and not together. So, you can, if you make prehistoric in genome, you want to have both those aspects. I do the query and I get ancient genomes, 45,000 years old. Very surprising. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I can look at the documents a little bit longer. Nowadays, people can have uh, DNA from uh, thousands of years old humans and animals, like here, 45,000 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I f yeah, this is very clear to uh, Ariadne. Uh, but you also know, I want genome and totally not prehistoric, or I only want genome. I hope this is a little bit clear. Actually, I did, did put a function there to just remove a line. Uh, but if you click on an existing line, it moves this line to the top. And it only stores the last 20. And essentially, if I'm, since I'm reading what's at the bottom, which I hadn't um, read before, because why read directions when you can just uh, uh, Watch, watch things in play. So if things are in the middle, it's ignored, essentially. Yeah, and then so moving things to the right or to the left is really what, what um, does the action. I understand this now. This is a really um, very clever little feature, I think. And I can imagine you, you guys probably have a lot of fun uh, playing with this, although as you said, um, Rob, uh, looking at medical information can be somewhat hazardous to your mental health. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> Next time we should have choosing a, a more fun scholar. That's right. That's right. Like uh, children's children's liter journal of children's literature. We should get all of the publications and yeah. abstracts from children's literature. I try to take care in having reasonably uh, nice examples. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I I appreciate uh, I appreciate you not not scaring us too much. Um, so that's great. I'm not seeing uh, any more questions from our. Uh, from our uh, audience today, I'm wondering, um, uh, we have our colleagues um, Tizia and Mercy, and if either of you have uh, any questions or observations, we'd love to hear those as well. Um, but this is just a really terrific demonstration. Very happy to have this. Uh, Robin Shingwei, I think you said that, um, uh, that you'll have a, uh, a, a website that can be shared in the coming future about uh, where people can do uh, exploration on their own? Yes. Yeah. working that, yes. Yeah. Okay, super. So we can contact people who, um, after the fact, so uh, we've recorded today's webinar, we have the slides to share with you, um, and we will be uh, uh, sharing those out, but then later on, uh, when the website is available, we can contact you again and, um, and share that information as well as sharing it more broadly. So uh, I want to thank Robin Shimwe so, so much for, um, for staying a little late in your time zone and um, sharing uh, all of this fantastic information with us today. Um, I want to once again uh, thank the audience for being, uh, for, for sticking with what I said was a, a fairly fairly technical presentation, and uh, we'll give you five minutes back in your day. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.